Did the ETH DAO hack have any impact on Bitcoin? Um, let's see. If I remember correctly, that was, what, May 2016? Yeah. Um, I don't remember a lot of impact on Bitcoin. Like, that was a that was a recovery period for, for Bitcoin. Like, you know, late 2015, we kind of came out of the bear market with, like, one big candle, uh, much like April 2019 came out of that bear market, like, similar, you know, 25% a day kind of thing. But then, yeah, so then after that, the first, like, half of 2016 was kind of trading in the, you know, Four, four to five hundred range, if I, if I remember right, and I, I don't recall the DAO hack having a lot of impact on on Bitcoin specifically. Then the, the reason I ask is because dramatic things in Bitcoin affect the rest of the crypto market. Yeah, you know, Bitcoin suddenly had a twenty percent down day. You know, every other shitcoin is going to have a twenty five percent down day. Or whatever. Oh yeah, but we were talking earlier about the uh, ETH mergers coming. Yeah, and if that is some kind of disaster, could that have a contagion effect into Bitcoin? And I, I don't know. It's probably more possible now than it was years ago, just because other assets are, are bigger relative to Bitcoin now. Like, you know, Bitcoin dominance has been going up lately, uh, but, you know, it's still like, what is it, 50% or something now? I, yeah. I don't know exactly. But, but you know, it was still like, you know, 90 something percent uh, back, you know, as, as flawed as that metric is. Like, you it's, know, it's a, it, it's a massively flawed metric. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I I hear you, but it but it but it you know to your point of whether things it, I think it is relevant in terms of like if you're asking the question can things from you know another large asset spill over uh, in, into into Bitcoin land like th there's there's some possibility of that but like I don't know I I mean I think if uh, you know if ETH catastrophically blew up like yeah you 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 might get you know an event it might affect you know Bitcoin. You know, similarly to how Luna did, um, where you know people who don't know all that much about the space just kind of want to be risk off about the whole thing, yeah, just, you know, for a certain period of time. But it won't take that long for it to become clear that these are very different things. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, smarter people will come in and understand the difference. So, a, a good question for you regarding ETH, because uh, again, I wasn't really around in 2016. I didn't get back into. I think it was like maybe December 16, January 17. Uh, it's a very small crypto scene, highly dominated by Bitcoin. What was the view towards altcoins around that time, pre-ETH and when ETH came along? Because right now it's obviously reputationally for Bitcoiners. <laughs> Some of them just fucking hate everything. Uh, Some of them call everything a shitcoin and they won't have anything to do with anything. Right. But when the first altcoins came around, was there like some excitement about it or was there instant i mean a, a lot of people instantly wrote a lot of it off because the first altcoins were were like you know clones of bitcoin well, okay so like the very first ones in 2011 were like kind of interesting technical experiments right and then like you know it wasn't it wasn't an environment where like they're clearly trying to like you know steal bitcoin's network effect or like you know grab some monetary value because like <laughs> like that time period was like a nasty bear market and you know kind of you know the the price stuff wasn't as big a deal, um, but then the 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 big alt wave that um, that created maximalism really I would argue was uh, 2013 when you had just a ton of clone coins like Litecoin was a created in 2011 but started getting a lot more popular in 2013, and it's just you know a handful of parameter changes to Bitcoin right like it doesn't fundamentally do anything different than Bitcoin it you know it doesn't add anything. Uh, that Bitcoin doesn't do and will never do. Like so, so there's like no, there's no way to, uh, in my opinion, like to argue that there's any value creation there. Um, and there were a ton of coins like that. You know, there's Feather Coin and Quark and like a, all sorts of stuff that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and there were, but you know, there were still altcoiners, right? Like there was still a bunch of you know traders who you know just wanted to like ride a you know ride a wave and. Get their charts out and do technical analysis and you know buy these things and you know talk them up on at the time like reddit or bitcoin talk or you know twitter was a thing too then um but uh that did that did result in you know a lot of a lot of bitcoiners being like this is ridiculous and uh and all the altcoins we've you know, <laughs> we've we've seen are are, are dumb <laughs> when he yeah. first started getting talked about was that seen as different? It, people... ETH, ETH was different, yeah. So, so it. Um, I mean, not everybody thought it was different, but uh, but there, I, I think, it was one of the first that uh, 
uh, proposed to do something fundamentally different than Bitcoin, just to like occupy a different domain. Like, you know, um, you know Bitcoin wasn't going to offer Turing complete smart contracts. Like Bitcoin, you know, took this, you know, security first, you know, simplicity uh, first uh, uh, viewpoint and was trying to do, you know, global money. Uh, that's different than what Ethereum was trying to do even at the beginning, um, even though, you know, they somewhat changed the mission over the years. But um, so, yeah, so so there's some there's some room there uh, for, you know, even ardent Bitcoiners, I would say, even Bitcoiners who, you know, hated all prior alts to be like, okay, well, this one is actually different. And there, there were a few prior to that. Um, Monero was another one that, uh, you know, offered something that, you know, Bitcoin probably never would, you know, uh, uh, namely, you know, protocol level privacy. It's uh, Monero is a funny one. In, in all of my time as a, started as a, Bitcoiner just because I needed Bitcoin, then started going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and becoming an altcoiner and trading altcoins and shitcoins to becoming a maxi. But I've never, ever, I don't think I've ever called Monero a shitcoin. I've always, I mean, we talked about it earlier. I've, yeah. It's always been the one I've, I can have a very solid argument for why I would use it. Someone might want to give me an argument for why it's a shitcoin because it's not Bitcoin or problems they see with it. Um, but right now, I can think of multiple use cases I could have of that right now that I can't do with Bitcoin. And I've always felt that. I mean, when I when I interviewed uh, Fluffy Pony for the first time, I said there's uh, there's Bitcoin maximalists and there's Bitcoin maxis who are like, yeah, Monero is okay. <laughs> yeah, there there is some of that. And and yeah, and I think it's because it was the like the first, you know, altcoin that came around that, you know, credibly offered something different than Bitcoin. Um so I think I think like if you're if you just kind of like understand uh, you know, understand what the use cases are, and uh, you know if if this thing is just trying to like ride Bitcoin's coattails, and you know, you know, uh, <laughs> you know people say affinity scam off of it, uh, then it's one thing. Uh, but if if it is doing something uh, technically different that that has that has value, then then that's another. And I think that's a distinction that that happened uh, sometime in that like 2014 to 2016. Uh, period and yeah, ETH launched, I believe, in 2015. Yeah, and, and ETH, um, despite what people, I'm, I'm not a fan of ETH. I've got no use for it. Uh, well, actually, it's not. I guess it's not true. Uh, I think there's a solid argument for stable coins, and sure. I think some protocols uh, offer a much better pathway and use case for stable coins than than Bitcoin has right now. And I, I, yeah, and and I expect. Uh, Higher quality uh, stable coins to come to Bitcoin or Lightning somehow. Yep. I I can't tell you I how because I hope so. I'd love to see stable coins on Lightning. Yeah, I would. I would love a stable coin on Lightning would be incredible. I don't know how it can be done, but I'm sure it can be, and I'm sure I know people are working on it. Yeah, that. exactly. I've heard a little bit about that. Yeah, and that would be awesome. Um, and that's the only stable coin that I would need to use. It'd make a yeah. lot more sense to me. But um, there are people right now who need, need stable coins all around the world. There's an absolute fundamental need, and if they have to use ETH or Tron to do it, fine. I, I have no. I have no issue with that. Um, but one thing I will say about ETH, despite me not being a fan, is it started to prove prove it has its own resiliency outside of Bitcoin. Like yeah. the way Bitcoin has it, it has survived its own, and we will talk about the DAO hack in a minute, it's survived a constant attack from Bitcoiners with some highly valid criticisms. It suffered from a wave of ICO failures and maybe NFTs as well, we, we will see. But it has its own resiliency. and some of what people might be feeling with ETH right now is similar to what people have felt with Bitcoin, but you can explain what's happened with the DAO hack. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ETH is kind of a cycle behind Bitcoin, I think, in terms of, you know, just to follow up on what you just said there. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think like, I think ETH and Bitcoin are, are very different things, uh, but they but they do kind of stand, you know, uh, alone, you know, they're uh, relative to most of the other assets in the space, which just feel like startup equity, whereas, uh, yeah, Bitcoin and ETH are... are are different than that set and and very different from each other. And I think you know that's that's my own mental model there. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. With the with the DAO hack, um, uh, yeah. So <laughs> that that was basically ETH's um, kind of you know fork wars uh, event. Um, very different than than what happened with with Bitcoin a year later. But um, it was a it was a fork war on launch. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, let's see. So th there was a DAO that had collected um, some 
egregious percent of total <laughs> total supply of ETH uh, that then got hacked. Um, and you know the hacker you know controlled these these uh, coins. Um, the Ethereum community, I believe, led by the foundation, got got together and uh, decided to basically. I don't think this is technically technically accurate, but you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, roll back the chain to undo the hack, um, which is you know a very aggressive thing to do in a blockchain, right? Like it's all supposed to be about code immutability and uncensorability. Yeah, exactly. Code is law. Like why are, why are we all here if we're uh, you know re reinventing you know kind of you know committee based you know systems? Um, so that, you know, so yeah, that was a big kind of existential moment for for ETH. You know, like, which way are they going to go, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, like Ethereum Classic came out of that. that you know, the the version that didn't roll back the hack, uh, and but the community went with uh, went with the version that did, which is you know, the Ethereum we all refer to today. Um, so yeah, I think uh, a bunch of people had had a lot of opinions about that. <laughs> what did you think? Um, I. Was I was very much opposed to uh, rolling it back. Like I, I thought it should stick to stick to being immutable and code is law, and like that that you know uh, that smart contracts that uh, did what they say and wouldn't be messed with by uh, you know by you know people's you know, whims or opinions. Uh, I thought that was the interesting thing uh, that ETH brought to the table. Uh, so so when they rolled it back, it was kind of like okay, well. I'm not sure how how much we can rely on that anymore. Is it fair to call it a hack, or is it an exploitation of a weakness? Yeah, in code? And, and, and exploits probably a, a better a better description because I mean I, I mean all hacks are exploits in in a way. So um, I don't know the semantics of it, but but well, I think it, of hacking as diving into a system, yeah. a locked system, and and, and stealing something out of it. And, but but and you are you know hackers are always exploiting you know some software bug usually unless they're guessing passwords or whatever but they're you know they are typically exploiting some uh, some code that does something that the developer did not intend right and that that's what happened with the with how the smart contract for the DAO it was called on ETH was well let me put it a different way say if I figured out a way to hack into a bank account and steal and take your money. I don't see that as an exploit. I see that as theft. Was this similar or was this? Well, yeah, people came down on, on both sides of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky one because I'm wondering whether, say, if that person had kept their ETH and they'd been found, had they committed a crime? Right. I, so I would argue it's kind of all about the social contract and expectations yeah. of, of the ecosystem, right? Like, you you know, you put your money in a bank, you expect that... Uh, <laughs> You know that it, that it's going to be there, and you know they're not going to give it to you know a, a, an attacker, right? Um, whereas when you know when you put your money in a smart contract system, I, I think what you are, you know, the, kind of the deal you're agreeing to is whatever that code says, you are okay with. Code um, is Oregon. Yeah, uh, and that's my opinion. That's you know, some might say that's an extreme opinion of smart contracts, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> 